All right, I think it was in this class. If it wasn't, um, then I'll, I'll review it. But I showed a graph that related the cost of making a change to an application as a function to the stage that the change needed to be made. And simply put, the further along that you get in the project, the more expensive it's going to be to change it. All right? So what does this mean? This means a couple of things. First of all, it means that spend a lot of time planning because if you find something missing in your application and you need to change it, it doesn't cost too much to change it at that point. All right? So, therefore, most of the changes will be down that end of the spectrum. The other implication of that is to employ good programming practices because good programming practices will flatten this out a little bit. Still going to have the same basic shape, still going to increase over time, and in fact it's going to increase at a faster and faster rate. All right, increase at an increasing rate, so it's curved upwards like that. But if you employ good programming practices, you're still going to end up gaining because it'll be less difficult to make changes to your applications. Um, one thing that's inevitable in any application is change. Uh, applications need to be changed for any number of reasons. There's bugs in them. Something doesn't work right. All right? But even if you are perfect and there are no bugs in your program, there are things such as the requirements change. You know? Um, if, for example, there was a change in tax law, then every payroll company that processes payroll would need to change their payroll application. It has nothing to do with the bug. It's not like they did it wrong the first time. They did it right initially, but the rules changed. So their programming has to take into account that change. All right. Um, in addition, companies' policies may change. There may be new requirements. There may be additions to the, to the application, and so on. So the one thing that you can count on is that an application that you develop is going to need changed at some point. So therefore, we're going to try to do the best we can to employ good programming practices to make it easier to change. So what are some of those good programming practices? If you think about it through this class and through other classes that maybe you've taken, maybe the web development class, you'll notice a theme. And that is how we take and we take a piece of the functionality and put it in a separate place. All right. For example, in, in just plain old web development, even before ASP.NET uh, pages, we put our CSS in one place. We put our CSS in a CSS file, and therefore every one of our pages can use it. All right. Well, that's directly related to this because if we decide that we need to change our site, the colors of the site, or if, if, if our organization rebrands and changes their color scheme, for example. We don't have 10 different places that we have to go or 100 different places that we have to go and hunt down the code that makes the color a certain way on our site. We have one place or maybe a couple places, but if all the changes are isolated to one or maybe a few CSS files. We just go in them, make the fix, and that fix is reflected everywhere on the site. <clears throat> so that's one thing we do. We take certain chunks of code and put it by, it, them by itself in, in, in another file. And then we link to it. Another example is what we've done with the custom classes. Right? We've made a component for something that is important to our problem. And again, the big advantage of that is we can then use that component wherever we need it. So. Um, we used, um, you know, in, in, in rock, paper, scissors, in the dice game, we took certain functionality and put it in a custom class, which means that if we have something similar to that on another page, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> you just create the new user interface and link to that user interface through your code. Your code then in the ASPX file doesn't really do any of the processing of any significance. It simply links the user 
uh, interface to the, the rules, the business rules or the problem rules. So we, that, that makes it more maintainable to have it designed that way. Because again, think in terms of more complex business functions like a shipping calculation, a payroll calculation. If all of that is isolated in one place, then it's very easy to go and change that one place. It's easier, let's put it that way, I won't say it's easy, but it's easier to go and change it in the one place and have to track it down in several different places and make the change several different times. Because you're gonna mess up one of them. You know, even if you copy and paste, you're gonna copy and paste wrong or you're gonna end up changing something else or whatever, all right? Now the one thing that we don't have a solution for yet we have a solution about where we can put our C-sharp code if we want to share it between pages. All right, that's our custom classes. All right, we have a solution for where to put our CSS code if we want to share it between many pages that in a separate CSS file. Um, what we don't have is we don't have any place to put common HTML code. All right, if you think back for your project in CISS 216, you probably made a template and then you cloned that template several times and you made five or six copies of it for however many pages you had. Then you went back and made each page do what it was supposed to do. The problem with that is, is what if you needed to define a, a re redesign or a redo something that was in, uh, in the content of the pairs on every page? Because on every website, there's a set of content that appears on every page or pretty much every page, all right? Something about like the, the banner on the top of the page, um, the logo on the top of the page, the navigation scheme, something like that. Something, the footer, something that's common on every single page. What if you had to go and redo that, all right? Well, after you've cloned your template, you have to go and make that change in five, six, ten, a hundred, however many pages you have. And, well, that's sort of not good. That's sort of the opposite of what we're trying to do. We're trying to have all our code in one place so that we can uh, reuse the code and, and we can have it so that if we make a change in one place, a change gets reflected throughout it. Well, what we're going to study today are things about the user interface that allow us to put our HTML code in a common place, all right, among some other things. Uh, but specifically the HTML code, we're going to put in a common place so that many pages can share it. So if we decide that we need to change the common areas of the page, then we can just go and do that. The one thing I failed to mention that we don't really talk about a lot in this class, but um, we talk a little bit about it in CISS 216 and we talk about it a lot in CISS 232, is you can also put your JavaScript code in a common file so that many pages can use the same JavaScript file. So we have solutions for everything except HTML. Well, that's what we aim to do today. If you think about it, a lot of pages on a site are going to have a very similar sort of layout. And we could look at some pages on, on a few different sites and, and we'll see this to be the case. Now there might be some variation. For example, sometimes a home page looks a little different than the rest of the page because the home page is a special page. And sometimes you might have sections of a site that look a little bit different than other areas of the site. But generally speaking, a lot of sites, and especially if you're talking about smaller sites, like what you might do for the project, it's going to have a very consistent look. And that's a good thing. You want your pages to be consistent. You want your pages to be consistent so users don't have to guess where stuff is. That if they get used to seeing something in a certain spot, it's going to be there. It's going to be there on every page. All right? But a very common sort of layout for a web page would be something like this. We would have a banner on the top of the page. That might include a logo and some words. We might have a navigation here. Or maybe the navigation is oriented horizontally. There's like a couple of typical places. Sometimes it's even on the right side of the screen. But there's a handful of places where usually the navigation is going to appear. We're going to have a 
content area of the page. And that's going to be the one section that's going to be different on each page. All right? So it's going to be, you know, on one page it might have information about, might have an about me page. Another page it might have uh, examples of my work. Let's imagine this is a portfolio or something like that. So this is going to be the section that's going to be different on every, on every page. Then finally we're going to have a footer that might have my email address and so on. All right? So, the stuff in those, these three sections are going to be pretty well constant on every single page. All right? Now again, there might be some slight differences, slight variations, but generally speaking, that's going to be, on a smaller website, those are going to be pretty well constant on every page. This section is going to be the section that changes, because that's the page that has the unique content for that page. All right? So that's our aim, is to be able to find some place to put this stuff. So that when we make a new page, all we have to do is change this stuff. All right? And what's more, if we have to go and change something in the header, we want to put something in here, then we just need to change it in the one place. And we don't have to go and change it in every single place. So that's our goal for what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to do not Zeller's Inc. We're going to do Going Community College's CISS programs. Sounds like way less fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, Aww. Zeller's Zeller's Inc. is about CISS programs, so it's the same amount of fun. Oh, right. All right. So. Yeah. Well. But Zeller's Inc. sells pizza. Yeah, Zeller's Inc. sells pizza. CISS programs. Yeah. Okay. You talk me into it. <laughs> we'll do Zeller's Inc. All right. Zeller's Inc. It is. So, Zeller's Inc. is interested in what? Is interested in pizza. It's interested in video games. Specifically, it's interested in console video games and handheld video games. Yeah. This is an eclectic company, as you can tell. All right? In fact, we're going to stop this from being Zeller's Inc., and it's just going to be Zeller's because these are just things I'm interested in. Uh, we're also interested in music. All right, and so on. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Maybe under music, we're going to have listening and performing. All right. Do you play an instrument? I do. If you look at my arm, you can probably tell that. Those of you that mean, this is a flute. This is a, uh, let me say, a fingering chart for the flute. Oh, wow. So, yes, I do. <laughs> I also sing. I also started singing, like, last year. Yes. So you said that's flute. Yes. I thought that was saxophone. Uh, the, the, key, the key charts for a saxophone and a flute are very similar. Okay. Like, I picked up a clarinet once. And was able to, I think all those instruments have this system called the Boehm system. Wow. Where oh. the, this guy like figured out a way to make keys on instruments or something. And I think that is on a bunch of different instruments. So I think they're very closely related. I, 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 I guess I haven't taken a close enough look at that. Because I'm like, that could be, I'm like thinking, I'm like, is that clarinet? Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay. Um, well, I'm sure we'll discuss that on my website, right, <laughs> to get more information. Okay, so the idea is going to be that this much is going to be constant. These three pieces, this is going to be variable on each page. And we're going to accomplish that by creating what's called a master page. All right, 
So that's what master pages are for. We probably have seen when we created a new web page, it says, says something like use a master page or inherit from master page or something like that. And we've always left it unchecked because we haven't made any master pages yet. Well, now we're going to start doing that. So this would be a good practice to do, not just on this assignment, but, but all assignments going forward. So you have a consistent look. And you can create a navigation, and you can change it. So that's what we're going to do. Um, when you create a master page, you get components that are going to appear on every single page, and you can define those. And then you get two areas. You get a couple of areas by default, and you can add more if you need them. You get two areas that are called placeholders where you say, hey, I'm going to fill in this section on each individual page. You get, a, you get a section in the body and you get a section in the header where you can put the code custom to that page in the, in the header and in the body. All right, so onward and upward. As I do this, I'm going to do some CSS. I'm not going to spend hours like designing perfect CSS, but um, we're going to uh, we're going to do something with that. All right, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the CSS stuff. All right, simply because um, we want all our pages to look complete. Yes. So therefore, we'll at least do some rudimentary CSS to make it look complete. So, go into Visual Studio. File, new, website. Okay, an empty website. I'm going to put it on my desktop, and I'm going to call it Zellers. Doesn't exist. You want to create it? Yep. Visual C Sharp, empty website, stored there. We're good to go. So I'm going to go and create that. It gives me my empty website that contains the web config files, so I'm good to go. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a master page. All right, so I'm going to go up here and say file, new, file. And one of my choices down here is a master page. All right. I'm going to give it a name. And I'll call it main. All right. It's possible to have more than one master page on your site. It is also possible to nest master pages, where you have a master page that inherits from another master page. And we'll talk about all that, and we'll talk about when you use it. You'd use that um, essentially when you have pages that are going to look alike, but not exactly alike. Uh, a good example of that would be if you go like to LC's website. You go to a certain area, academic resources, let's say. Advising and counseling. Notice that this part of the site stays the same on just about every page. This part of the site stays the same within this section of the site. All right. Whereas if I go to another section of the site, campus life, let's say, there's something else in this position. This part's the same. This part is the same within the section that you're in. So some sites have sections. So the multiple master pages, the uh, nested master pages we'll talk about, those are primarily for larger sites. All right, so I create my master page, and I say 
select uh, place code in separate file, I'm going to say yes. Select master page, I can't do that now because I don't I haven't created a master page yet. And then I'll click add. I then get what looks like a regular web page. It does. With two exceptions. All right. The two exceptions are, as I mentioned, in the page, there are two areas that are called content placeholder. Like I mentioned before, there's a section in the head and there's a section in the body. There is. All right. Now, I'm not going to put anything in these in the master page. All right. This is simply saying what section I have available on each individual page. And I could have a couple of different areas, right? By default, it gives you one. But I could have a couple of sections that are custom to each page, in which case I could create two content placeholders. But in this case, since we have a simple enough site, we only identify one area where the code is going to be um, custom for each page. Now, as I build this, I'm going to build this, and I'm going to apply HTML. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to apply CSS to the HTML I create. All right. Now, I can create this with HTML, and I can create it with ASP.NET controls. So I can put both HTML and ASP.NET controls on this page. I can also write code to manipulate those ASP.NET controls. All right. So I can, in, a, in essence, I can do anything I can do on a regular ASPX page, I can do on a master page. And that functionality will get copied onto every page that inherits from this master page. So, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, first of all, get rid of this div. Actually, I'm going to change this div to a section. Why am I doing that? Well, section is more of an HTML5 thing. Div is more of an HTML4 thing. Right. So, I'm going to go in and I'm going to, I can still use a div. It's not like I'm going to get arrested or anything. But, um, <coughs> but it's more true to HTML5 to use the HTML5 tags. So, with that in mind, I'm going to create my header that looks like this. And for now, I'm just going to go very bones and say Zeller's, Zeller's land. Yeah. I'll make that two words, otherwise it looks like Zeller's land. <laughs> yeah. Zeller's land. All right. I'm going to put my navigation here. I'm going to put some navigation in now, but we're going to end up redoing the navigation. So I don't want to spend tons of time putting navigation. I'm going to just go and redo anyhow. Right. So I'll just put a couple of my pages here. I'm going to have my home page, which typically is going to be called default.aspx. on my home page. Navigations, again, typically are ULs, un, un, uh, unordered lists, and each item is, a U, uh, is an LI. I cannot type for anything today. So I'm going to go and copy this just for the heck of it.
I don't even really play video games a lot, but I really have been hooked on Tetris lately, so we'll include this one. So here's here's my four pages, and again, we're, we might come back and add some pages later, but this is good enough for that. And we have my footer at the bottom of the page. do something, I just put a nice paragraph that says, email Mike for more info. I'll make this a email link. If I look at this, whoops, I can see it. I can get a preview of what this is going to look like by going into design view. And there's my sections. Uh, no styling, of course. I'm going to go now and I'm going to create at least the start of a uh, CSS document. All right. So I'll go up in the file, new file. CSS. And I'll just do a little bit with the style. I'll say for this, the body, font, family. say float left. Now I'm going to give a width of 20%. Inside of my section. 
And again, anything I can do CSS-wise with IDs, with classes, I can do here as well. Um, with 70%, padding 5 pixels, background white. And finally, the footer with 100%. Yeah, we'll keep it like that. Let's see what this looks like. Again, my aim isn't to make something that's perfect. I'm going to save everything. My aim is to make something that demonstrates what you can do with this. I could put a title in here um, and say, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm going to avoid, actually I'm going to avoid putting a title in here because this is my template. I'm going to then create a link to my CSS file, link href equals main CSS, rel equals style sheet, type equals text slash CSS. We go and view this now. That's what that looks like. Again, good enough for what we're trying to do today. All right. How can I view this in the browser? Oh, I really can. I don't think so, anyhow. Because this is this is not a web page. This is a shell of a web page. What happens if I click this? Well, I'm going to get an error. Because it's going to be looking for debug, or not debug, default. And I don't have the default. Okay. All right. So I made my master page. Each page then that I clone from this master page, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start off by saying I'm going to use this master page, and then I'm going to go in and um, change it. Let me get rid of the uh, bullet points because I, I don't like those. space between them two. All right. So there's a little bit of space there. I'm actually going to put a little bit of space to push that section over. So I'm going to say on my section I'm going to say margin left 10 pixels. I would expect those of you that have taken CISS 216, this is largely review for you. If you have questions about what I'm doing here, feel free to ask me in lab and we can review it. But that should bump it over. And there we go. So, yeah, that's, that's what I want. All right. So I've now created my master page. I'm now going to start cloning that master page for my different pages in here. So I'm going to go first to File, New. File. I'm going to create a web form. By default, it's giving me the name of default.aspx, which is good, right? Because that's what I want to be my home page. That's what I've created the link for on my page as a home page. Place code in, in separate file, I want to check that, like I've been doing all along. Lastly, select master page, I want to select that one now. So I click Add. It will ask me which master page I want to use. Um, and I only have one, so I'll pick that one. Now I get something that is not, does not look like a whole web page. It looks like a section of a web page. Right? I get two 
contact areas. Well, guess what? These contact areas correspond to the content placeholder in the master page. So for example, this one has a content placeholder ID of head. If we look here, that corresponds to this content placeholder. So anything I would put in here would appear in here, would sort of get pasted into there when I actually run that page. Essentially what happens is when I run a page now, it assembles that page. Remember, the server does some processing to create a web page with, uh, with ASP.NET. So one of the things it does, it takes all the code in the HTML, or I'm sorry, in the master file, and it merges it with the code that's in the specific file. And the way that it merges it in is anything in here is going to get put in this spot. Anything in here is going to get put in this spot. All right. So, notice that I can't put anything here. Let's do this. Let's just say home page. I get a green squiggly there. Why is that? Content is not supported outside of script or ASP content region. What that is telling you is the only place that you can put stuff on these pages that are clones of the master page are in these two content placeholders. So I can put this down here. Notice no squiggly line because it's legal to be there. So the only place you can put the code and the actual page is in those content areas. So what I can do for my home page is I could have a, an H1 tag that says this is a home page. I can then have a paragraph. This page is dedicated to Mike Zellers. Noted. Oh, I don't want to brag too much. Professor at Lorain County Community College. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to put Greek text in here. That doesn't mean that you get to do do that. Greek text is okay for design and for planning purposes, but it shouldn't be on a completed page or completed assignment. Greek text, again, is sort of filler text. So, placeholder text. So I'm going to go here, Google some Greek text. Give me one paragraph of it. here in a paragraph tag. Now I can go run this page. And what it will do is it will simply stick the master page and this page together. The master page has sort of the shell of the site. The stuff that I put in the content areas get, gets put in the master page in the appropriate content placeholder. So that stuff gets put here. If there was anything up here, it would get put up here in the head section. So let's go and run it. Right. <coughs> and there we have it. Wow. All right. So the thing to keep in mind with this is the, the time, the amount of time that it takes to create 10 pages isn't going to be 10 times the amount of time to create one page. 
it's going to create, it's going to be, um, um, you know, an amount of time to create your template, your master page, and then uh, the time to create the custom content for each of the other pages. Okay, so let's go and let's make a pizza, video games, and music page just to finish things out. Yeah. All right, so we'll close this. Process to create a page. We went and said new file web form. I want to select from master or select master page, so I want that checked. This I'm not probably not going to pick default to. All right, default for the first one is okay because that's your home page. This I'm going to base on what I call the links, and if I remember right, I called the pizza page pizza. Place code in separate file, yes. Click add. What master page to use? It's our only one, so I'll pick that. And again, I get a snippet of a page that only contains two content areas that I can put the stuff that gets put in the master page. Yes? If you forget to hit that um, make the master or select the master page, is there a way to get that stuff? If I forget to select the master page when I do it, the answer is, is yes, there is a way. All right, because if you look, if you compare this with a regular page, there's just a few extra things in there. All right, there's something up here and all that. I have noticed, it's been my experience, whenever I try to go and do something like that, there's always something I forget and something doesn't work. So I would typically probably just delete the page and create a new one. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put just some shell of tags uh, for the pizza page. Pizza is my favorite food. All right. I'm going to create the video games page. Let's check to see what I called it. I called it video games. So I'm going to go file, new, file. the master page. Again, I get the placeholder. to create a web page for music. exciting things to do in this world than watch me type. Okay, so now I've created my four pages. All right, make sure everything's saved. Go and run this. All right, spelled that wrong, but I can go and navigate to these other pages. And notice how the layout is consistent. That's great, right? Wow. The layout is consistent because all of that code comes from one place. I know I had a typo on the music page, so let me go and correct that. Now, if I want to 
want to go and change something on a page, I have to decide is that the common area or is this the additional area, the area that's unique to both pages. So for example, maybe I want a little paragraph underneath Zeller's land, something in the header that goes and explains, um, explains the purpose of the site. That's something that's in the header. So it would be something on the common page. So I would go into the master page and I could go into here and just say a page about the interests of my sellers. So I can go and add that. Now when I run it again, that gets added to every page without having to go in and physically adding it to both pages because each page now is a merger of the stuff that's in the master page along with the stuff that is in the specific page. Any questions at this point? Remember, generally that's a question. Yeah, Mr. Sowers, I wanted to ask you a question. My question is, um, when is midterm, when are our midterm grades going to be? Um, I don't know. You don't know? No. Okay. Um, there isn't a midterm in this class. There so is? I'm not sure what a midterm grade is. Oh. Uh, I think professors have the options to enter a midterm uh, grade. Um, or they have an option just to say that you're passing or failing. Okay. Okay. Um, typically, questions like that are better to ask me like after class or in lab. Okay. So. Or, or no, that's okay. Or, or email them to me. Okay. Um, you know, generally speaking, during the lecture, we want to keep on the topic that we're talking about. All right. So. Same thing applies if I want to change the nav, if I want to change the 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 footer. All I would have to do is change it in the common area, and then every page gets reflected with that. Yes? We need to add a new content holder after we've made the master page. How would we do that? If you want to add a new content holder, all right? Let's say you wanted something in after Zeller's land that... That goes change, horizontally. Yeah, that goes horizontally that changes with each link. Okay, so I want something here that goes across the entire width of the page. All right? Let's, let's try to do that. Like, you know, home could be a page about interest in my sellers and pizza. It says, who doesn't like pizza? Right. Okay. Sounds good. All right, let's go and, let's go and do that. All right? This is adding a content area after we've already defined the master page and, and this. Um, ideally, and again, that's a great question. And you never know when you'd have to do that, because you may plan to do it one way and then realize that you need another area. It is good, however, to sketch things out in advance and to get it as close to the way you want it to be in, ad in advance. But if we had to do that, this is how it would work. I would go in here and go into my master page, and I would go and... Notice this is kind of neat. I think it works this way. Notice that when I pasted it, it automatically updated the name of content uh, placeholder to. All right. So that gives us the ability to put something in to that area. All right. Now, we'll go to the page, um, and we can go and put content in that. So I will go in and go to my default page, and interesting, sort of didn't put that in there. So what I can do is I can copy that and say it relates to content placeholder 2. 
and then I can go in and say, this is a home page, I could say something like, there's no place like home. If I go and view this in, in, in section of the page. So what would I have to do to fix that? I'd have to get more specific in my style sheet. And the best way to do that would be to look at the HTML that gets generated here. And we'll notice that sections IDs and then write style code for that because right now there's nothing they're both sections so I can't really grab a hook onto one of these it's important it's really important to look at the HTML get, that gets generated because remember what you have your hooks in place to put style on you can put your style on place uh, you can put your style on HTML tags well, we can't do that here because they're both sections we could put our style on um, tags within tags. Well, we don't have a case of that. We can put styles based on classes. We can put styles based on ID. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out of here. I'm going to give each of these sections an ID. We'll call this the quick because it's just a little witty thing that's going to be on this page. And we'll call this the content. Then I can go and change my CSS to say, instead of section, I can say pound sign content, and I can give a style to the quip. my quip, there's my header, quip section there, and if I go to another page, there's nothing in there because I haven't gone back and filled in that content placeholder for this particular one. Which I can certainly do. about this. 
what's something that you might put in the heads content um, content placeholder? I'm thinking things like JavaScript, um, all alternative um, CSS files. You had a CSS file for when you printed something um, that you wouldn't that that where you'd want a particular layout if you were going to print the page instead of view the page on the screen. If that was unique to the page that you were looking at, you could put um, a, a, an alternative style sheet there. Or you could put JavaScript there. Questions about this? Yes? So if you were doing something like, uh, like how, uh, I can't remember which class we're doing it in, but like radio buttons, or like they had to select different things on different pages, is that something you would put in the JavaScript, in the header, in um, like a content area? Well. Like if you had a website about mathematical Right. And that each one, that each different page was a different selection of items. Right. Um, you could put it there. Uh, you, given the fact that you're doing ASP.NET, you probably would use the built-in validators for that. But if you did have some code that you'd want to execute JavaScript-wise, you could put that in the, the head area for that. So, yes. Another question? Um. On the master page, <coughs> if you wanted to add like kind of a generic title to each web page, and then within the uh, placeholder for like the head section, mm -hmm. if you were to put a specific title in for that, would that override the That's a real good question. Let's find out. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put title of, Z of Zeller's Land up here. And on my default page, I'm going to put So you put it up here. You wouldn't put that in the content view. You put that here. I forgot about that. So I would say home page. So now when I run it, says home page for the title. If I go to pizza, it says Zeller's Land. So yeah, that's that's how you do that. I thought that one was a little different. I, I um, but yeah, that's how you would do that. Questions. Now, let's think of um, some sites have a more involved navigation. So like, for example, with pizza, I might have my favorite kinds of pizza and my favorite pizza places, right? They both say the same thing, right? All of them. All of them is my favorite kinds of pizza and all of them is my favorite pizza places. <laughs> well, that's not true. I don't like onions, so no pizza with onions. And I'm not going to make a stand on the, the controversy of 2017 of whether pineapple belongs on pizza or not. I'm okay with pineapple on pizza, although it's not my first choice. All right, but anyhow, I could have underneath each of these pages, I could have sort of like sub-pages, right? So I could have, uh, under pizza, I could have kinds of pizza, pizza places. Underneath video games, I could have... Um, Council video games and mobile video games. Underneath music, I could have perform. And I might want to do something cool so that I can expand and contract the um, second level menu selections. Sort of like this. But on a, in this case, it would be a much smaller scale. Like here, if I go to ESPN.com, you 
each of these main selections has a submenu that pops up. I could do something similar to that. Well, you might be able to see where this is heading. I have two choices on doing that. I could write the code myself. Boo. Right? Yeah. I have pizza to eat and Tetris to play. So I don't want to write the code myself. Or I could use a .NET component. That's where I said that I wasn't going to spend too much time on the navigation because um, I can use a component for that. And the nice thing is, again, this is going to be in the master page. So I can go and I can make my changes to this guy right here and be in business. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of my unordered list to do this. And I'm going to drag, let me hit stop debugging. I'm going to drag over into that nav section. And I can either do it on the visual view or I could do it on this view. I'm going to go in and go into the navigation section and I'm going to put a menu. We have two things that are similar. We have menus and we have tree views. All right. We'll look at both of them. They essentially do the same thing. They allow you to have a structure to your menus. And what do I mean by structures? In other words, a real simplistic menu would have all the items on the same level. A little more structive, structured menu would have a few choices on the top level, a few choices on the second level, on the third level, and so on. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag over a menu. And I'm going to put it here. All right. Put it there. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say edit menu items. Notice that we have an option to choose data source. And we'll be doing this at some point of the semester where the web pages are defined somewhere and we simply link this um, menu control to our list of database, uh, our list of uh, pages. But right now, this is sim very similar to a drop down. I'm going to go and I'm going to create those manually. So I click Edit Menu Items. I can add one. First one is my home page. So I want the text to be home. I want the value to be, that can stay as home as well. I want the navigate URL to be default.aspx. I can add the next one. And it can be pizza. My URL is going to be pizza.aspx. Now, I mentioned that I might have one, I might want to have some sub menu items underneath pizza. So I can click add a child item, and that will put it underneath pizza. So I don't have I haven't created these pages yet, but I could. So I'll put pizza places. And I could say my URL is pizzaplace.aspx. You know, I haven't created that page yet. I can go back later and create it. I always do that. I always click OK when I'm not done. So I have to go back into it. This is going to be my favorite kinds of pizzas. I am, but we're going to fix that. And navigate URL will be pizza type. Now, if you notice here, I did this wrong because that is underneath, that should be underneath pizza. You can always promote or demote. So, boom, that will go and move it over. So I'm going to add another root item for, what was my next thing? Um, video games, thank you.
Oh, this should just be the video games page. I forgot I didn't have that one yet. I can add a child to this for video games mobile. Another child of this for video games console. Could add another root item for music. The navigate URL. URL for that is music.aspx. Add a child. And add another. Now we haven't created some of these pages yet, so we're going to get some errors if we go and click on them, but I just want to show you what the navigation will look like. Alright, right now it looks like this, okay? Now I go and run this, that's what the navigation looks like. The ones with the little triangle next to it indicate that there is additional information. There's an additional level. So if I hover my mouse next to it, it'll give me those additional options. So I could click and go to the pizza page if I wanted to, or I could hover over there and pick pizza places or pizza types. Likewise, I could go and do the video games and see video games that, music, music performing, and testing, or uh, performing and listening. So I very easily, without coding any of this myself, have a nice little structure with the, with the, the mouse over menus. And I can go several levels deep. I didn't only, you know, um, you know, if you were doing, imagine doing a clothing store, you might have um, adults clothing, men and women, men's shirts, men's pants, men's shoes. Under men's shirts, you might have Formal shirts, uh, casual shirts. Underneath formal shirts, you might have tuxedo shirts, button-down shirts, and so on. So you could go as many categories as you need to deep. All right. Uh, we just went two, but you just essentially do the same thing. All right. Now there's a small hitch in here, and we'll look at this on Tuesday. All right. The little issue is notice when I mouse over that sort of illegible. is illegible, right? Because it shows over uh, over the text, yes. Is that something that you can fix by making like a sub-nav in the CSS? Exactly. Yes. This is a CSS question, right? And that's what's important to identify. In fact, we might go ahead and fix this now instead of waiting until next time. All right, because we have, we have about five minutes left. This looks like about a five minute problem. All right, it, it's, it's very good to be able to identify right off the bat what kind of problem it is, all right? Is there a problem with the content? No, the content is correct, all right? On a regular web page, it's probably either gonna be an HTML or a CSS problem. On a ASP.NET page, it could be an ASP.NET component, an HTML, or a CSS problem. In this case, it deals strictly with the parent, so I would say this is a, CI, a CSS problem. Now, we have to put a style on something to make it work the way that we want it to. The question is, is what do we put our style on? 
Well, unless you got this stuff memorized, which I sure don't, we look at the HTML. Yeah, look at HTML, exactly. And as I scroll down, notice a couple things. Notice it already inserted some style for that, and that can get tricky, right? Because that can interfere with what we're trying to do. But if we look at these, all of these second level links have a class of level two. So I should be able to do this. Should be able to say class of level two dot level two and I should be able to give it a background color of white. Now when I go to run it that goes and We can at least read that. We do get a little interference with that. I'm going to go and I'm going to put some padding on that as well. That makes it much easier to read. We could play around with stuff like make it transparent if we wanted to, but that seems to work um, as well. Is the default transparent, or well, what's happening? Well, what's happening is there was no style rule applied to level two. Because there's no style rule applied to level two, there was no color associated oh. with it, and therefore it ended up as transparent. All right. Now, it does get confusing sometimes because if you notice, Some CSS was injected by our ASP.NET controls. Based on the properties. But if we know what HTML gets generated, we can then go in. Because notice that CSS is nowhere to be found in my master page or the individual pages. So it got put there by the server. It generated that HTML code based on the control. Yes? Is the HTML code generated the same for each browser? That is a great question. I believe it does. I can't say that for 100% sure, but if I had to bet on one, I'd say probably it does. The idea is... Um, we're sort of getting away from, you know, and, and we've been away from this for a while, but um, you creating different code for different browsers is kind of, uh, if you absolutely don't have to, have to, have to do it, then don't do it. Yes? So is there no way to adjust that? Like if, this, if the browser creates code and it's something you don't want? Well, keep in mind, it, it, just to make sure we have the terminology right, it's not the browser that's creating the code, it's the web server. When it processes these controls, it would create the code. Is there a way to, to, to not do it? Yes. Um, we'll review this in more detail on Tuesday, but if you go and look at this, there's actually a whole bunch of properties associated with this. So it is there. Yes, yeah, some of it is there. And of course, we saw a way to sort of override that 
simply by putting in our own CSS code. And that would do it as well. All right. Uh, I will go and unlock the lab for you. I'll come back here and uh, get the files that I need, and then I'll be back.